his only son to earth to give mankind a second birth. Still many seek some other way. Can't they hear the Father say? Isn't it enough I sent my son? And isn't he enough, the Holy One? How could it be enough, the work that you could do? His blood's enough for me, why isn't it enough for me? someone near you. 1 Corinthians in chapter number 15. And while you're turning, let me just uh, mention a couple things. First of all, let me introduce uh, my family. Actually, most of my family is gone now because they're in children's <laughs> church or nursery. But my name is Tim Thompson. My wife, Brittany, was playing the piano a moment ago. And then God has blessed us with three boys. Seth, who is the oldest that pastor's buying. And then uh, Samuel, who is our four years old, who I tried to throw in along with the deal, and he wouldn't go for it. And uh, Asher is our almost two years old. I guess he's 20 months old, 21 months or something like that. So uh, three boys, and uh, we travel around in uh, our fifth wheel and travel around to different churches all over the United States, and sometimes into some foreign countries. We get to go into Canada on occasion, but usually just in the United States and enjoy very much the ministry that God has for us. And then uh, we have the privilege of being here with you all. We've been here several times before with Dr. Bill Rice, usually, but uh, this time um, without him and in this capacity in preaching for revival and looking forward to seeing what the Lord's going to do in our hearts all the way through this, through this next several services to the next several days. First Corinthians, oh, by the way, let me just mention this real quickly, because sometimes there's confusion, and maybe it could have been with the kids or whatever, but sometimes, like when Brittany got done playing, um, you weren't sure, am I supposed to clap, am I not supposed to clap, then one person starts and then nobody else does, and you're kind of going, do I or don't I, I'm not really sure. Well, just so you know, usually what we do anyway, and I think it's probably this way here at the church as well, um, whenever somebody plays a piece or sings a special or something, we always think of that as being primarily as being um, directed towards the Lord. That is, we want all glory to go to God for that. If, if we can sing, that comes from God. And the message that we're singing, that's for the purpose of being a blessing to God. No, we want it to be a blessing to you as well. So oftentimes when I'm in services and I hear someone play or hear someone sing and, it's, and it blesses my heart and I'm grateful for it, now what we do oftentimes is church, in church rather, as opposed to clapping, is just we'll say something like, well, amen, which means let it be so, which means the message of that song touched my heart. So you don't have to at all. But if you hear a song sung or hear it played and you're wondering what can I do to show that that was a blessing or an encouragement or I enjoyed that, 
in church, it would be perfectly appropriate for you just to say amen or um, to smile or something like that. But just so uh, no one's wondering, am I supposed to clap or am I not supposed to clap? It's not like clapping is wrong. It's just, again, that we really want to make sure to direct all attention that everything that we do is for the purpose of uh, giving this to God. Which is why, like at the end of my message today, I know you all want to stand and clap and everything like that, but that won't be necessary. I'm just, I'm just teasing. All glory always goes to God, and so we don't clap for the person, but instead we can agree with the message of what was played or what was sung, and we do that by saying amen, and that's fine, just so you know that for the future. All right? Let's look together at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We're going to read in verses 1, we're going to read rather verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, verse 5, first part of verse number 6. This is 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Hey, if you're physically able, just to show our public respect for the scriptures, would you mind standing with me? And then we'll read together. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verses 1 through the first part of verse number 6. I'll read out loud if you'll just follow along silently. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of, a, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once. We'll stop right there. Father, thank you for the time that we have together this morning. I pray that you please, again, help us in this time as we look at your word. Help the message of what you want to deliver, the truth that you wanted us to get. May that be what is at the forefront of uh, my speaking and the words that I use. Help me to be able to clearly explain what your word has to say and what it is you're talking about here because only what you say matters. It has the highest authority. And so help us, please, in this time. Holy Spirit, I know I can't convince anyone of anything, but you can. So please, take the message and drive it into the hearts and minds and the consciences of each person that is here. And may every person leave fully convinced of what you say, that it is true and that it affects their lives. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask these things of your Father. Amen. Thank you for standing. Please be seated. In verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, there is a word that is used that's not one that we use commonly every day just in our talking back and forth. It's a good word, and if you are ever around somebody that, uh, what I referred to, I did this morning anywhere, anyway, as gray hair, no hair people. That is, someone who's a little older might use this word, but for the most part, unless you were raised in church, it would be a word that's unfamiliar to you. Look back at verse number 1. I want to show you what it is. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, he says, I declare unto you, or I'm preaching unto you, or I'm writing this unto you, I write unto you, declare unto you, the gospel which I preached unto you. Okay, the word gospel is a word that you may have heard used if, uh, if an old-timer were to say something like, uh, hey, what I'm going to tell you right now is the gospel truth. What they would mean by that is, what I'm telling you is really true right now. Now, the rest of the time I'm talking, it may be a lie. But right now, what I'm telling you is the truth. Sometimes the word is used that way. But the word gospel actually does have a meaning. And the meaning of the word gospel is uh, good news or glad tidings. So when the writer here says, I declare unto you the gospel, he's saying, I'm giving to you some good news, some glad tidings, something that I want you to get because this is something that's good and it's good for you and it's exciting. Now, I don't know if you're anything like I am, but I like hearing good news. Um, you watch the news at all or listen to uh, talk radio? If, if you ever watch the news, read the news, listen to talk radio, you do it because you're a glutton for punishment. That is, you watch it and they may... They may say some good things that are going on, but for the most part, it's almost always everything that's bad that's going on. Now, they do that because people are drawn to bad news. I guess because we want to know that somebody else has it worse than we do. I'm not certain the reason for it. 
But whenever I, I'm a little bit of a news junkie. If I read the news, if I listen to the news, if I listen to talk radio, after a little while I think to myself, seriously, can't somebody tell me something that's good, something good that's going on somewhere in this world? Um, I like to hear good news about the weather. You know, the weather's going to be nice, it's going to be sunny. Yesterday, we had the event yesterday, and Pastor, I asked Pastor on Friday, hey, what's the weather supposed to be like? He said, I think it's supposed to be good. I prayed about it. I haven't actually checked the weather yet, but I think it's going to be good. So he's more of a man of faith than I am. I went on uh, Weather Underground and uh, looked it up, and it was supposed to be nice. So I went, yes, good news. It's going to be good weather tomorrow for our event. So, you know, we hear good news about the weather. We like that. We hear good news about things going on in the world, about wars. Uh, you ever been? You ever gone to the bank to put money in, taking money out, and they give you a little slip of paper that tells you how much you have, what your balance is, how much you have left, and thought to yourself, I could use some good news right about now. <laughs> All of us like good news about whatever. We like to have good news. Well, the good news, the gospel, good news mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 15, the glad tidings, is not about the weather. It's not about um, our financial status not about the wars that are going on or not going on. It's not about the political events. The good news mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel, these glad tidings, are specifically about how you and I, as human beings, can know with certainty that when our bodies die, that when my body dies, that I'm going to live forever with God in a place called heaven. Now, friend, that is good news. If, in fact, I can know, and if I can know with certainty, without doubt, that when I die, I'm going to spend forever with God, well, that has more value as good news than any of the other things that I've mentioned. I mean, wars start and wars stop. Money goes up, money goes down. The weather changes. It's warm, it's cold. Well, it's warm, and then it's less warm here. But it's, it, the weather changes. If it's good, it's bad. Things go up and down all the time. But if I can live knowing, not just hoping, but knowing that when I die, I'm going to spend forever with God in heaven, that my sins are forgiven, well, that's good news. And according to 1 Corinthians 15, where we just read, the writer, the Apostle Paul, who was inspired by God himself to write this. The writer gives to us what God says about how we can know for certain. He says, I deliver unto you, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news about how you can know for certain you're on your way to heaven, which I already preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein you stand. Verse number three then, the Apostle Paul simply lays out. He simply says, now, let me tell you what it is that makes up this gospel. Let me tell you what's involved in this. In verse number three, he says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. He's talking about the gospel. And then he gives us three elements that make up the gospel. I want you to see them here this morning in the time that we have together. Look down at verse number three, halfway through, beginning with the word how. It says, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and then verse 4 says, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Okay, so here, God gives to us three elements that make up the good news, the gospel, about how we can know for certain that we're on our way to heaven. I want to share with you the three elements, according to what the Bible says here, and you listen to them, and uh, I, I might have you memorize them with me, just, just so uh, we can get them in our brains, and hopefully get into our hearts as well. Three elements. The Bible says how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Element number one of the Gospel is Christ. The first part of the Gospel. The first part that makes up the good news about how we can know for certain that we're on our way to heaven, that our sins are forgiven, that we're right with God. How we can have peace knowing that forever our security, our salvation, our soul is set and on its way to heaven. Part number one, or element number one, is Christ. Secondly, the Bible says that Christ died for our sins, or I would say it's the us part of the gospel. So, number one is Christ. Number two is us, because it affects us. Christ died for our sins. And then the Bible says it's according to the Scriptures. Now, oftentimes we refer to the Scriptures as the Bible. It's the same thing. So we have Christ, 
and then secondly, us, and then thirdly, the Bible. It's according to the Scriptures. So, three elements make up the Gospel about how we can know for certain that we're on our way to heaven. Number one is Christ. Number two is us. Number three, the Bible. Okay, you ready? I've said it several times. Do you think you can do it? Yeah. Should I go over it one more time, or do you think you can do it? Number one is Christ. Number two is us. Number three is the Bible. Here we go. Ready? Three elements that make up the Gospel. The good news about how we can know for certain, according to what the Bible says, the three elements that make up the good news about how we can know for certain that we're on our way to heaven. Number one is Christ. Christ. Number two is us. And number three is the, the Bible. The Bible. So we have number one, Christ. Number two, us. Number three, the Bible. Number two, us. Number three, Bible. Number one, Christ. Number two, us. One, three, two. Uh, <laughs> now, I've been a little bit silly with it just to get it in your brain. But all three of these elements are important. All three are necessary if you're going to understand what, what God says is the gospel. And just real quickly, I'm going to walk through all three of these elements. I'm going to start with number three and work backwards if that's all right. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins and that it was according to the scriptures. Or it was according to the Bible, what God had said. Why, why is that so important? Why is it so, the think, why is it so valuable? Why is it so important that the gospel is according to the scriptures? Well, this Bible that I have in my hand, that you hold in your lap or somewhere on a chair beside you, this Bible is the Word of God. Everything that is in it comes straight from God. This, this is what God says to us. And everything in the Bible is absolutely true because it comes from God. The Bible says about itself, all Scripture is given by inspiration or breathed out of God. Everything that is given to us in the Bible comes from God. Now, men wrote down what God told them to write, but it's God who gave it to them, and then these men would write it down, and then it's given to us. And really, I mean, there's a lot of people who would argue, who would say, well, the Bible isn't really true. After all, they say, there's so many contradictions in the Bible, so many things that don't match up. First of all, when somebody says that, I would always want to ask, well, what contradictions are you speaking of? And most of the people who would say there's all kinds of contradictions in the Bible would not be able to tell you any of the contradictions that they think are in the Scripture. But some people do argue about contradictions in the Scripture. For instance, they'll say things like, hey, did you know that the Bible claims some things in history that really did not happen? And people for years and years have said that. And yet, time after time after time, though the Bible is not primarily a history book, any time it speaks to things that took place in history, as time goes on and researchers go and check it out, eventually all history points to the accuracy of the Scripture. Though it was written over hundreds and hundreds of years, yet it has remained accurate. It is accurate historically. Now, I'll tell you, the Bible is not primarily a science, a science textbook. But where the Bible speaks to science... It's always right. Let me give you a for instance. For years, hundreds of years, scientists said the world is flat. If you sail far enough, eventually you'll fall off the edge of the earth. And for the hundreds and thousands of years, scientists, who obviously can't be wrong because they're scientists, said the world is flat, and yet, for thousands of years, God has said the world is a sphere. It says so right in the Scripture. It's a circle. And lo and behold, after we got some things figured out, the world is a circle. So somebody says, well, scientists say that we're here as a result of millions and millions and millions of years, and we know scientists can't ever be wrong because they never are about anything. And yet God says that He created the world. So at some point, and this is just a couple of examples, but at some point, you've got to look at what, how, how often God has been right and how often mankind has been wrong. And you've got to draw attention, even if you're just a logical person, to look and see, well, the Bible has been right time after time after time after time. There must be something to this. And if the Bible is right in all of these other areas, historically, scientifically, then it stands to reason that it's also right about anything and everything that it says. 
This book is right on everything that it talks about because it comes from God. Now, why then, back to the original question, why is it so important that this gospel comes according to the scriptures? Here's the reason why. Please don't miss this. Because if this book comes from God, and it does, and this is the gospel or the good news, and it's according to the scriptures, that means that the gospel message that I'm giving to you right now from the Bible has God's stamp of approval on it. This is not a good news message about how you can have peace and go to heaven based upon something that Pastor and I got together on and decided what needed to take place. Or that a group of churches or a group of men a thousand years ago got together and determined this is what's necessary in order to get to heaven. It is according to the scriptures which points to the fact that it is from God. It is what God has said, therefore it must be true. So that when everybody says, well, this is the way I think about how to get to heaven, or this is the way I think about how to have peace, or this is the way I think life will end, or this is what I think eternity is all about, if it does not match up, if it's not according to the scriptures, then it's not according to what God has said. But the gospel message that I'm declaring to you right now, that's about Christ and it's for us, this gospel message is according to the scriptures, which means it has God's stamp of approval on it. This comes from God, therefore it must be true. This gospel message is according to the scriptures. Now secondly, this gospel message is for us. I like this. Did you know that good news is only good news if it's good news to you? It's a lot of good news is in the morning, isn't it? <laughs> this good news, good good news is only good news if it's good news to you. Let's say, let's say this morning I came in, I said, hey, I got good news, good news, good news, everybody, good news. Somebody in this auditorium is going to receive fifty thousand dollars, a brand new Corvette, and an all expense paid trip around the world. You want to know who it is? Me. It's me. <laughs> it's me. Isn't that great? I'm going to get fifty thousand bucks, and I'm going to get a Corvette, and I'm getting an all-expense paid trip around the world. Isn't that great? And you say, Brother Tim, not especially. <laughs> well, why not? Well, you say because you're getting it, and I'm not. And some of you are out there thinking, well, if you got fifty thousand dollars, you'd share some of it with me. <laughs> you don't know me very well. <laughs> no, good news is only good when it, when it affects you. I mean, it's only good to you when it affects you. Now, you could be happy for somebody else. But in order for it to be good, it's good as it applies to you. Let me tell you the great thing about the good news, the gospel, about how one can know that they're on their way to heaven. Now, please hear this. It's for you. Now, here in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, the Bible says, that Christ died for our sins. When it talks about us, it, it pulls to us, it draws to the forefront of our attention the fact that we are sinners. That we have broken God's law. That we have gone against what God says, which is true. I mean, if you think about it at all, it is true both by our nature and by our choice. We've sinned against God. I have. You have. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's not a social statement. When I say we're all sinners, I'm not saying, hey, you're bad, but I'm a preacher. Not like that at all. No, 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 no. All of us have done things that are wrong. And I don't say that, and the Bible doesn't say that, as if to say, wait, we're all in the same boat, so we're going down, but at least we're all going down together. It's not, it's not that. It's just, it's just showing to us, putting in front of us, what we already know to be true. God says, don't do some things. He's the creator. He has the right to, to determine how we're supposed to live. He set up his moral law, and we have disobeyed his moral law time after time after time after time. I've lied. You've lied. I've stolen. Perhaps you've taken things that don't belong to you. God says we're not to take his name in vain. I'm not supposed to use his name lightly as a byword. Oh, my, and put in the name of God. Well, I've done that, and perhaps you've done it as well. The Bible says that uh, we're not we're to honor our father and mother. Well, let me ask you, and be honest with yourself. Don't answer out loud, but be honest with yourself. Have you honored your parents completely, perfectly? Well, I certainly have not. All of us 
have done wrong. We have sinned against God. And the Bible says that the wages or the penalty for sin is death. Literally, separation from God forever in a place that was created for the devil and for his demons. A place called hell that is a real place that literally burns with real fire. Jesus Christ spoke about hell as a literal place, not as a figurative place, not as a difficult time on earth. It's not like, oh, today was a day where it felt like I was in hell. It's not as if the Bible or God uses it just as an idea. It's a literal place. And all those who reject God's way of salvation will be forever separated from God in this place. And we have earned it. It's not as if God is a bully that doesn't want people to come to heaven and so he made up this place. No, no. God is a holy God who can't allow sin into his heaven. And all sin must be punished. And the punishment for sin is that separation, that death. But he wants people to be able to come to heaven. Therefore, he gives us the good news about how we sinners can be made right with God. This gospel that I'm gi giving to you, this good news that I'm delivering to you, it's according to the scriptures. It has God's stamp of approval on it. It is for you. If you're a sinner, this is for you. If you've done wrong, this is for you. If you deserve death, this is for you. All of us, all of us do. And so this is for each one of us. Individually. Part number one, Christ. Part number two, us. Part number three, the, the Scriptures of the Bible. It's according to the Scriptures. It's for us. And then lastly, it's by Christ. The Gospel, the good news, centers around the person of Jesus Christ. Now friend, if you don't know who Jesus is, please, you, you may know about Him. But, but if you don't know Him, if you've never if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let me just, let me just tell you, in, in a nutshell, what is given to us in the Bible, what God reveals to us about, about who Christ is and what Christ did. Who Christ is. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was born on this earth. He had a human body. But His Father was not a man by the name of Joseph. His Father is God. In a special way, God the Father allowed a young woman, a young lady, Mary, to conceive. And she bore a son. And they called his name Jesus. His Father is God. He is the Son of God. Though he was human, yet he was deity. He was God. How can that mix? Oh man, I'm not sure my mind can comprehend it. It's one of those things that God says it, so I believe it. I don't fully understand how it can all work. But as a human being, he grew up, he hungered, he thirsted, he uh, got tired. When a thorn poked him, it hurt. He was tempted in every area of sin, just like you and I would be, and yet he was perfect. He never one time did anything he was not supposed to do. And he always did everything he was supposed to do. He was human, but he was God. The Son of God. Someone special. The things that he did to prove that he was God. The miracles he did. I told some of the kids yesterday this. The teenagers to whom I was privileged to preach yesterday. The miracles of the blind who had received their sight. About the storms that were, that were told to stop. The, the lightning and the, the waves as they were out on the sea and the clouds and the thunder. And Jesus Christ stands up and He says, Peace be still, and the clouds depart and the winds cease. These are not made up stories that a group of men decided to, to attribute to someone who is a fictitious character. This is recordings, historical recordings of what Jesus Christ, the Son of the God, did. And He was completely perfect in all of it. But the greatest act of love and mercy that Jesus Christ ever performed that we know of on this earth was when Jesus Christ allowed men whom he had created to take him one day, beat him beyond recognition as a man, spit on him, mock him, slap him, punch him, a whip slashed across his back, a crown of thorns beaten down into his skull, mocked and made fun of, then a trial of sorts 
where no evidence of any count was brought, and yet the will of the people was to have this Jesus crucified. And so the Roman ruler at that time, Pilate, said, fine, let him be crucified. And then Jesus Christ, the Son of the God, allowed himself to be nailed to a cross, and the cross raised up and dropped down in a hole, and Jesus Christ for hours hung naked on a cross in absolute shame. And not, listen to me please, not any of it, not any of it was for the purpose of his paying for anything wrong that he had done. He had done nothing wrong, but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was shed on the cross that day for the purpose, listen, of paying for your sins and for mine. The Bible says this about Jesus. It says, He who knew no sin, He was without sin, became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. In other words, a perfect God-man, Jesus Christ, became or allowed Himself to become the penalty for our <laughs> sins, to take upon Him the price of our sin. Because here's God the Father in Heaven who can't allow sin into His presence and sin has to be paid for. And so people have to be separated from God forever in this place called hell. But Jesus Christ, who was perfect, offered His blood on our behalf. Shed His blood. And Jesus Christ took the death that we deserve to die. In fact, when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, and the Bible says that our sins were placed on Him for the first time in eternity past, and the only time in eternity future, the Father turned His back and would not even look at His Son. He separated Himself from Jesus Christ the Son so that Christ, in that moment, suffered all of hell on the cross, being separated from the Father. And all of this was for the purpose of paying for your sins and for mine. Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. He was buried, so says verse number 4 and that He rose again. That is, Jesus Christ came back to life, proving that He is who He claimed to be. I have a brother who for some time was working with a group of kids in an inner city ministry. And in speaking to them, each week he would take time to explain to them something about the Gospel. And he finally got to uh, the, the time when the resurrection was was going to be talked about. And he was asking the kids some questions, a group of 20 kids. And they, they weren't kids that grew up in church. They didn't sit down and listen with their hands folded. They were sitting uh, out in the park where they were, and they were bouncing all over and everything. And uh, my, my brother, in talking to these kiddos, said, hey, how are you guys going to get, the, how are you going to get to heaven? Who's going to help you get to heaven? You can't get there on your own. You don't even know where it is. How can you get there? Uh, who's going to help you? And somebody stood up and they said, Mary, Mary's going to help us. And my brother said, Mary's dead. She can't help you. Mary can't get you anywhere. She's dead. And somebody, he said, the only way you're going to get to heaven is if Jesus helps you. And one of the kids said, well, Jesus is dead. And he said, ah. But three days after he died, Jesus came back to life. And one of the kids said, man, if that had been me, I'd be like, I'm back, y'all. <laughs> well, that's how our kid sees it. And perhaps how you and I would respond if someone killed us and we came back to life. If, if, now forgive me, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but if you or I were God in flesh and nobody believed us and they killed us and we came back to life, we might be tempted to say, hey, I'm back, y'all. But Jesus Christ, in His resurrection, by His resurrection, in essence said, I am who I claim to be. And what I did is enough. After all, logic would say, if Jesus is strong enough to save himself from death, then isn't he strong enough to save you from your sin? Hey friend, I've got good news. Good news, gospel. This is, this is good. Christ 
died for our sins. It's according to the Scriptures. It has God's stamp of approval on it. This is His way. This is not a way. This is the way. It's for us. It's for you as an individual, not something that's done as a family or corporately. Each person, it's for you. Let me tell you something. It is all by Jesus Christ. Salvation, forgiveness of sins, knowing for certain that you're on your way to heaven does not come to a person who says, all right, I'm going to try my best and I'm going to be good. I'm going to turn over a new leaf, and from now on, I'm going to try not to do anything more that's wrong. I'm going to be a kind person, a moral person. I'm going to do these things, then I can get to God. There's no work of righteousness that we can do. Salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, heaven as our home, God as our Father, a changed heart, all happens to the person who says, in essence, I can't save me. I let go of anything I think they can get me to heaven. And I put my trust in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. In fact, back to verse number 1, and with this I'll close, 1 Corinthians 15. Look, look, at what, look at what the writer says. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, that is, I already told you about this, which also ye have, what's the next word? Received and wherein you stand. In other words, the only way a person can have their sins forgiven and know they're on the way to heaven, the only way a person can be made right with God is when you receive the good news according to the scriptures, Christ. To as many as received him, Christ, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Okay, friend, if you believe this to be true, why don't you receive Jesus Christ this morning? If you're convinced that this is true, why don't you just receive Him? Yeah. Ask Him to save you. He will. He wants to. Yeah. Well, I'm not good enough. I know none of us are. Amen. But He'll save you. I don't have all the answers. That's okay. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you please to let the truth of this message sink deep into the hearts of every person that's deep into the heart of every person that's here. I pray, Father, that not any person would leave here without being fully convinced about who Jesus is and what he's done and then receiving him as their Savior, trusting him for their forever forgiveness of sins so that they can have eternal life, so that they can be your child. And then, God, you do the changing work. You said you would, so I know you will. You'll change them. You'll make them what you want them to be. But, Father, I pray that you let each person know with confidence that if they'll trust in your Son, that they can leave here knowing that their eternal life is set and secure in Jesus Christ. I ask this, Father, of you on behalf of the folks who are here and for the sake of the message that you gave me to deliver and also because of what your son did. And I ask it in his name. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, please no one looking around. I'll be looking, pastor will be looking, but I ask that nobody else look out of curiosity. I wonder how many this morning would say, Tim, I'm convinced that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be and that what he did on the cross is enough to pay for my sin and I want this morning to receive him as my savior I want to receive the message of the gospel I want to receive Jesus Christ so that I can have my sins forgiven so that I can become God's child so that God can God can then change my heart I, I want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my savior I wonder how many this morning would say, Tim, please pray for me. That's what I want. I'll not embarrass you, I promise. But I do want to pray for you. If that's true for you, if that's what you want, if you're convinced of who Christ is and you want to receive Christ this morning, would you raise your hand where you sit and let me pray for you? I'll wait just for a moment. Would you like to? You certainly can. If you're convinced, 
that you can't save yourself, but Jesus Christ can. Will you let us pray with you? Will you let us help you? Just slip up your hand high enough for me to see it. I'll wait just for a moment because sometimes people are trying to decide whether or not uh, they should. I want to give you just time. I won't, I won't linger long, but just a moment. Second question. How many this morning would say, Tim, I know I'm not perfect, but I have made that decision to trust in Christ and Christ alone. I've received the Christ of the gospel, and I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven because I've trusted Christ already as my Savior. If that's true, as a testimony of God's grace in your life, would you slip up your hand if that's true? You already know it. Well, good. good. A number of you. A number of you. Amen. Wonderful. You can put your hands down. Now, friend, if you don't, if you don't know, it would be our privilege to be able to pray with you, to help you, to explain things from the Bible, to answer questions. We'd love to do it. But please, please, at least take time to consider what's been said this morning and understand that it's not my thoughts, it's what God has said. Let's do this. If you're able to, with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just stand with me? I want to give just a moment, just in case there's somebody uh, who's trying to decide whether or not they should make the decision to trust Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to have someone help you make the decision. That is, to pray with you and answer questions. So what we'll do in just a moment is we'll stand, not yet, but in a moment we'll stand. When we stand, I'm going to pray briefly, and then Brittany's going to play a, a song on the piano. pastor will be here at the front. If that's something you need help with, you want help with, you come see Pastor. He'll get you connected with somebody, men with men, ladies with ladies. He'll get you connected with somebody who can help you understand the truth, who can pray with you, and you can leave here today, sins forgiven, on your way to heaven, and knowing for certain that it's true. Would you stand, please, everyone with me, if you're able to? And as you stand, let me pray. Father, please. Just in the brief time that we have together, I sense, dear God, that you're doing a convincing work in some hearts, and I pray that it would continue to impress the truth of this and the importance of this and uh, the timeliness of this, that it would be impressed on hearts, dear God. Lord Jesus, we are grateful to you for what you did, and I know that you did die, you were buried, and that you rose again, and if that is true, then to do anything besides trust you for salvation would be absolutely illogical, silly, and it really would be um, condemning to our own souls. So please, by your Spirit, convince. Please do. In Jesus' name I ask. As the piano begins to play, if a decision needs to be made or you have questions, would you just come see Pastor? He's up here at the front, opposite side of the piano. You come see him, let him get you connected with somebody. And you can know for certain you're on your way to heaven.